Uh, so yeah, uh, my name is Holden. Uh, my preferred pronouns are she or her, and it's tattooed on my wrist um, in case you or I forget. Um, mornings can be a little rough sometimes. Uh, and I'm a developer advocate at Google, um, which is nice. They pay me money. I work on open source software. Uh, yeah, it's fun. Um, I'm on the Spark PMC, which is where a lot of this experience draws from, but I also contribute to other projects, and I'm uh, on a few other PMCs, and I also work on a lot of smaller projects that you probably have not heard of. Um, very hipster. And I've been at a bunch of other companies besides Google. I'm a co-author of two books. They are completely unrelated to today's talk, but that should not stop you from buying them. Um, <laughs> in fact, the second one is the first book where I realized you could negotiate contracts, so that is definitely the book that you should buy, because um, I got a much better deal once I learned you could ask for things. Um, anyways, and you can follow me on Twitter, and I've started doing code review live streams as well in Spark, which I will talk more about as well. Um, in addition to who I am professionally, I'm trans, queer, Canadian. I live in America on a work visa, which um, the kind of work visa I have, they are currently debating as to whether or not they wish to keep it, and that's just a really great feeling for my life, um, and part of the leather community. And this is not directly related, um, but I think it's important, especially for, for those of you who care about open source communities, to remember that people have all sorts of different backgrounds, and we should try and be inclusive of all of these people. Um, and if we work together, we can make really awesome stuff, but if we don't um, do that and we chase away everyone who's different from us, then we'll just make the same old shit and we'll destroy the world with open source software rather than saving the world with open source software. I mean, either way, it will be open source, but I'd rather do good than light it all on fire. Um, my co-presenter today is Boo. Originally, my coworker was gonna come with me, but on related notes, uh, she could not for immigration reasons. Um, so I just have Boo, my stuffed animal, with me today. Um, she's very friendly. Uh, she also uses she, her pronouns, and she is the author of Learning to Bark and High Performance Barking. Um, Currently without a publisher uh, for those two books. They're, they're independently published, but if you know of one looking to enter into the dog-related book market, definitely get in touch. Uh, and her DMs are probably open on Twitter, although I don't know if she knows how to read them. Um, so I'm hoping you're all nice people. Um, you laughed at my kind of corny intro joke, so that's, that's a really good sign. Um, and you probably care about open source. You bothered to show up here, so yay, thank you. Um, and I'm really curious, how many people work on a project which is larger than they really thought it was gonna be? Okay, that is a lot of people. Um, so this will hopefully be relevant to you, and for, for the rest of you who are not currently working on a project um, that is overwhelming, uh, maybe this will be useful to you in the future, um, and you can sort of nip some of these problems in the bud. Um, but before we get too far in talking about the things we can do to deal with this, I, I think it's really important to remember it's totally okay not to fix this all. Um, a lot of us have a backlog of change requests and support requests and all of these other things that we really want to get to, but it's just too much, and that's okay. You don't have to accomplish everything. Um, that being said, I understand that that is a message that I have heard and then promptly ignored, but I still think it's useful to repeat. Um, and yeah, many of us wish we had more time to mentor folks, but you know, you can burn out on mentoring too. It's not just code um, that can burn you out. Um, and so do not become like that very sad broken umbrella. I like you as humans. Please continue to be lovely humans and not umbrellas. Okay, um, so we're going to talk about what changes when, when our project switches from like under 10 people to over 1,000 people um, and how this can make us feel kind of overwhelmed. We'll talk about a few different community structures really quickly. I assume people here are relatively familiar with the ASF community structures, but we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. We'll talk about how we can try and solve some community challenges with Perl scripts. Um, but that not all community challenges can be solved with Perl scripts. Sometimes we have to deal with the fact that humans are squishy and not programmable. Um, and this is, this is definitely biased sort of towards the problems the developers may feel more when they're trying to scale their community, um, just because those are the roles that I've had in these projects which have um, exploded a lot more than I thought they were going to. 
Um, and if, is there anyone who contributes to the Spark project? Oh, thank God. OK, cool. So uh, ignore the bottom one, and I am definitely up to date on reviewing all of the PRs, for sure. <laughs> OK, the other way of looking at this is, is our project on fire? Why is it on fire? Maybe we can make some marshmallows with this fire. Oh, maybe, maybe the marshmallows was not a great thing to do. We should have done something else. Eh, well, maybe we can put out the fire. O or not. Either way, it's OK. Hmm, those jokes are all over in America. Oh, well, OK. So let's talk about the fun of a small project, right? Like, a lot of us, like, we, we like, are working on a small project, and we're like, man, it would be so amazing if I had a whole bunch of people to come and help me out. This would be so cool. But, but be careful of what you wish for. Um, we, we have often simpler communication in small projects, right? Um, there's more sort of shared lore, and it's easier to just onboard new people slowly because they will pick it up more easily. Um, often, folks have more aligned goals, right? People tend to agree on smaller projects a little more. Um, and it, the other one is it's really often a lot easier to figure out who you need to talk to. Um, and this can be really challenging, especially in ASF projects, where you have a whole bunch of people who may be committers. But for example, if you come to me and ask me to commit a Spark SQL patch, I'm going to go, uh, no, let me go find someone for you. Um, and if you go into some of the other people and you ask them to commit a Python patch, if you're lucky, they'll say, let me go find someone for you. But they may just be like, oh, I should go find that person and then, and then put that in their to-do list, and then you never get a response to your email because humans. Um, and and the, the last one is, so consensus voting, um, many of us here may love it. Um, and it's a lot easier to do consensus voting with small projects because, yay, I have like five people. Um, but when I have to have 20 people all agree that we want to go in the same direction, this can get a lot harder. Um, and also with five people, like you can often benevolent dictator for life can just work, sort of. But large projects, other people do our work for us. Yay! Um, people can be like, yo, your software is cool. I use it. Um, sometimes this will make you happy. Sometimes people will use your software and make you sad. Um, you, you get lots of different ideas and experience. Um, this is really only true if your project is not all just a large number of people exactly like you. So if you're not seeing a lot of diversity of viewpoints in your project, maybe, maybe ask yourself why that is. Um, and, and the last one, I think, is really nice because I like money, and I live in the Bay Area where housing is really expensive. Um, and I enjoy being able to both uh, live in a condo and uh, eat food. Um, and so by being able to receive money for working on open source, life gets a lot simpler. Um, and when I go to people, I'm like, hey, what's up? I made this testing library. You should pay me to work on it. They're like, nah, no. No. But if I'm like, hey, do you want to pay me to work on this project which like thousands of companies use? They're like, well, that sounds like a smart business decision. I know how to business. And then you receive money. Um, to be fair, my understanding of business is similar to that of the underpants gnomes. So there may be... I'm glad to see South Park did make it over here. Um, so there may be some details that I'm missing out. So, OK, let's focus. Is our project on fire? This is the, the first question to ask. Maybe, maybe all of these open PRs are going to get merged really quickly, and it's totally fine. And the, the volume on the user list is high, but totally manageable. And it's not on fire. Maybe, maybe it's just very bright. So what can we measure to see if our project is on fire? Uh, we can look at the number of questions coming in, and then we can look at the number of questions being answered. Um, and if they start to diverge, a lot, that, that can be bad. Uh, we can start to look at the number of issues that are created and, and also resolved or closed. Um, and we can look at how old the open pull requests are or whichever form of accepting changes to your project you do. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of harder to measure things, but they will come if the more easy to measure things um, happen. Uh, the diversity one is not a guarantee, but, but please try. Um, yeah. Okay, so maybe you look at this and you're like, yeah, 
So last year, we had 100 questions. I answered 98 of them, and someone on the mailing list answered two. That was pretty great. Um, and this year, we have 1,000 questions. I also answered 98 of them, and someone answered 10. And uh, there's a lot of people who just keep sending the same question to the mailing list because no one's answering them. So maybe it is on fire. Yay! So um, I think that this fire comes from our classic pipeline of this theory that our users will become contributors. And contributors can be developers or they can be answering things on the mailing list. And then our contributors will become committers and PMC members and so on. And if any part of this pipeline stalls, the previous parts of the pipeline will be impacted as well. Um, and th this is, even if your pipeline doesn't stall, if you have a sudden rush of interest in your project, like say, for example, um, glorious employer decides to start putting marketing dollars behind your new fancy open source thing, and then you get a whole bunch of new users, even if you don't have a drop-off, like, I mean, we, we all have some drop-off, but even if we have a relatively stable pipeline, um, the sudden influx can just make things explode too. So yes, um, at the start, our distribution is like the only people working on the project are people who can change it, and they're all the, also the only users. And this is a really great time, except it's kind of lonely. Um, and I like humans, and if you don't, this can be a great place for your project to stay. Um, and with slow growth, if you have a way to turn your users into contributors and committers, this can go really well. And so this, this sloth is just going to slowly mosey along and slowly become a contributor, and some of them will mosey some more and become committers. But with hypergrowth, we get a bunch of users, and then, then maybe they become contributors if you, if you put in a lot of work. But then, then you have so many contributors and only a few people to review these changes that they burn out. And then your contributors see their code being submitted to your project and going nowhere, and so they burn out, and now you have sad users. Yay! N not, not yay. OK, the inverse of yay. Um, so, but I, I want to be clear. There are many ways for us to fail. This is simply one of them. We can all fail in our own unique, exciting ways. Um, so it could be like boiling a frog. Um, please don't try this at home. But your project can slowly get into a bad state if people are slowly burning out. Um, if your user to contributor pipeline stalls, you'll probably start seeing this in like question overload, but maybe not PR overload. And so this can be a good time when it's like, oh, hey, I need to put in the effort to try and get more of our users to contribute um, in either answering questions or coding. Um, if the contributor to committer pipeline stalls, you get so many PRs. And then you just don't review them. And so that's a good time to try and fix that. Um, and if the committer to management pipeline stalls, uh, and management is project management committee or whatever system you use to decide the people who are in charge of running the circus or whatever you prefer to think of your open source project as, um, then, then all of the other ones will fail. But like, later. So like that's like at least a good solid five weeks away. Um, and insert joke about CPU pipelining here. Um, no, OK. Remember Spectre and Meltdown and pipelines? OK. This goes over a lot better with C programmers. OK, so. <laughs> um, but the marshmallows are delicious. Maybe, maybe this all stalls, um, but I'm a committer. And because there's now like five of us and there's a bunch of companies using it, they're all willing to pay us giant sums of money. Why would I want to fix this problem? Maybe people won't pay me giant sums of money anymore. I become a replaceable cog again. And yes, being a replaceable cog is unpleasant, but a joy of capitalism. Um, ooh, that got too real. Um, but even even if you are making a lot of money as a result of an inherently bad system, um, you will burn out because you will become overwhelmed, and then you won't make giant piles of money anymore either. And so either way, this is not sustainable. Um, so OK, what, what can we do to sort of address the first problem, right? Question overload. Um, and so, so the first thing is stop trying to answer all of the individual questions, right? It can be very natural, especially if this slowly ramps up, to just be like, every morning I answer the questions, and then 
I'm done answering the questions, and then every morning it just takes more and more of your time, and then eventually you get afraid of opening your email client, and then you just stop. And so don't do that. Um, so uh, one option is Stack Overflow, which is um, special, uh, and people have opinions about it. But you can, you can sometimes trick people with shiny internet badges worth approximately $0 um, to answer your questions for you. And this is cool. Uh, but even, even if you decide that's not for you, the, the next question is, is your like, mailing list a Google group? Is it easy for people to find the answers? Are they, are they searchable? Or are you seeing like, a lot of repeats because people can't find the answers to your questions? Uh, to their questions. Um, so summarizing frequent questions, you can, you can just write documentate, just write documentation, sorry. Just writing documentation is way more work than writing the code, at least for me um, and for a lot of other programmers. Uh, you can ask for help. Um, you, you can go out to the users who might not want to contribute code, and you can be like, listen, I think you understand this really well. I think it would be really great if you spent some time answering some questions, and like, we could give you this shiny little internet badge of like, awesomeness, and like, then you can use this to receive more money from a hypothetical employer, maybe. And some people are like, that sounds fun. Other people, you offer explicit incentives, and then you take away the fun. So um, I don't know if it's 50-50, but good luck on that. Um, and, and the last one is filters. Um, so the, the other one is, if, if you're used to answering all of the questions in your own project, just if you realize that other people are helping now, that's great. Reduce the cognitive stress on you by just filtering out the ones that are going to be handled. Right? Just don't look at those and let other people take care of them for you and don't get worried about it. Of course, I say all of this and I have 22,000 unread messages in my uh, Spark label. So uh, good job, me. E uh, but on the plus side, I don't read those. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, I, I do have filters that pull out when someone is experiencing like a very specific PySpark issue around the things that I care about and know that either I can fix or I can answer more quickly than other people. And those are the ones that I actually let into my inbox and at least occasionally answer in between flights. Um, OK, so longer term, um, there are a whole bunch of really cool things we can do. Um, improving discoverability for your existing answers. So take your, take your good answers from the mailing lists and put them in a knowledge base or a wiki that you actually allow people to edit. Um, you know, maybe index things rather than Slack. I, I, I love Slack, but when, when I search on Google, it doesn't, it doesn't show me Slack history. And then I, don't, I just go into Slack and I ask the question again. And that's bad for me to do, but it's, it's just very natural. Um, take time and explicitly look at patterns. Um, I've tried doing clustering on this, and some, some other commercial vendors have, have done this, where they've done clustering on their uh, support questions. And you can, you can use this to try and find sort of um, unexpected clumps of issues. And then if you can see something that you can address with code or even just with, not, not just, or with better documentation, you can do it there too. Um, and the last one is you can try and trick people into um, creating courses or training material for your project. Um, if anyone is interested in writing a book about any of the projects I'm on, I am super happy to help you in a way which does not involve that much work from me. <laughs> Definitely for you. Um, just want to be clear. And thankfully, I don't see the people that I asked to be my co-authors in the audience here. Um, so please don't, don't share this with Trevor. It, it will be an adventure, unless he watches the recording. He probably won't. Anyways, um, so write a, writing has terrible direct dollar sign return on investment. Um, if and, and this is not always true, but generally speaking, if you find someone and you, and you trick them into this, you should be upfront about what they're signing up for. This may involve them walking away, but you can be like, listen, the royalties may cover your coffee if you don't live in San Francisco. <laughs> and, and that's good, right? Coffee is a substantial portion of my income, um, but I live in San Francisco, so it's... 
it, yeah, it doesn't work. Um, but the indirect ROI can be pretty amazing. Um, and there can be this like, thing where you're like, you know what? No one understands my project quite as well as I do. The solution to this is I will write a book. And now, now you have two projects to burn yourself out on. Um, and, and that does not go well. Um, I, I think if you want to do that, definitely find other people to work with and definitely find a publisher who has a sort of more relaxed attitude. Um, for example, please do not do this with Pact. Um, they will make very uh, rushed decisions. Um, <clears throat> Okay, yay, issue overload. Um, so yes, uh, this is our graph of our issues. Um, and purple is resolved. It's not going up that much. But don't worry, the number of created issues is going up. So that's good. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, Great success. So uh, one of the things which I think is, is pretty common, especially for projects like Spark, where uh, we do a mediocre job of managing our user list is people are like, well, I tried asking on the user list and I didn't get an answer. The solution to this is to create a JIRA. Um, and while it's true, some problems should be reported as a JIRA, not all of them should be reported as a JIRA. Um, but that being said, the, the people who are going to get that far into the process, if you can help them with answering their question, they're clearly willing to put in more work and maybe you can trick them into helping other people. Yes? Okay, I, I should probably stop saying trick. Um, convince, incentivize, persuade. persuade. That is a much more positive word. Encourage. Encourage, okay. Anyways, whenever I say trick, just, just hear other words and I will try and not say it as much. That that's totally works, right? I can just give you a regex and you'll evaluate that as a human. Um, and and the, the other one is um, lots of things can't and won't be fixed, right? Um, there's pretty common things where people come to us and they're like, I made this new machine learning algorithm. I'm going to make an issue that's awesome and let's, let's fix this. Or alternatively, I want this new machine learning algorithm. Of course I haven't made it, but that's what you do. And in both of those cases, the answer is no. Um, and some people have some success with autoclose. This is a personal taste matter um, as to what sort of vibe you want your project to have. I think some people react really negatively to autoclose, and you should definitely see how, if you do try it out in your project, see how your community responds, and if it is simply creating more like work than, than actually saving any, just turn it off, right? Magical tools are only useful when they help us. Yay, PRs. Um, okay, this screenshot is old. That is now, I think, 400-ish. Uh, um, but I chose this one because I like 386. Um, so, sorry. Um, anyways, and I, I actually like refreshed it a few times until I got the right one. So okay, we can, we can have an overload on the number of PRs. Um, and how do people react to, to contributor spikes? Um, people react in a few different ways, and I think most of them personally are bad. Um, one of them is people are like, oh my god, there are so many changes, I just need to raise the bar on changes. Um, right? And, and one of this is we can, we can start rejecting like small typo corrections, things that we consider trivial. Often I see people being like, this is just a documentation change, I don't need it. But it's like, oh no, no, you need those changes. Um, some people are like, you know what, if we made our tooling more accessible to people, more people would use it. So let's not make our tooling accessible, because there's already too many people. And it's like, Yes, you will have a lower number here, but that is not actually your problem. Your problem is not the number. Your problem is that you're overwhelmed. Um, and the, the sort of counterintuitive approach is, wow, there are so many PRs. Let's make it easier for people to do this um, because then I can, can trick people, uh, persuade people uh, into helping me with the review and commit process. Um, and the last one is people look at this and they're like, I have a social problem, I'm going to write a Perl script. Um, or Python script for those who were born more recently. Um, and 
sometimes this can work. Normally, no. Um, OK, so re rejecting trivial or irrelevant changes. I think this is really not good. Um, personally, if someone wants to make a lot of really small changes to the project, that person is amazing and could totally become a committer focused on all of the little tiny small things that we need to fix. And maybe they'll grow later, but like this person could take care of so much for me. Right? I would be so excited to add them. Um, the picking the non-standard system to make it harder, uh, I should avoid saying too much about that based on where I work. Um, and downsides of all of these, uh, the, the, the ones in red are worsens the issue overload. So if we reject all of these changes, we're just going to have a lot of open, unresolved issues, and people will just keep reopening them when we don't fix them. And the other one is, if your project is becoming big enough, um, you can put all of these sort of arbitrary barriers in the road, but it turns out that people like me enjoy eating food um, and working on open source software, and employers are like, we must have people contributing to this project, and then they give you money, and money overcomes all of your barriers by just making it so that if I don't overcome your barriers, I don't have food. Um, and this, this is not good, because now the only people you have are very determined and probably a little pissed off. Um, and while determined people are great, you probably don't want to have just kind of slightly pissed off contributors. Those are not a good state for them to be in. Do, do, do. What can we solve with Perl? Yay! Bots, bots, bots. Um, so if you, if you don't already have it, um, deciding on style guides um, and then creating automated tooling to, to support the linting, um, making it faster to merge, and I think uh, this is especially important for uh, ASF projects or, or projects which may have like a public-facing repo and then another like actual source of truth repo where like traditional tooling doesn't work and you have like a lot of steps to do merges just automate that stuff if you can um one of the things that i love about our review scripts is it automatically looks at the change and then proposes a new pr title and it will show me the old pr title and the new pr title before i hit accept so i don't have to go in edit the pr title go into my merge script and hit merge it's just like hey this didn't quite quite match the style i applied a regular expression to it just like i've asked you all to do and this is the result and then i go yeah that's what i want and i hit yes and it's awesome um, and the other one is, and I think this is especially important for, for growing new committers, is um, having automated review mentions. Um, and admittedly, I think this is important, but I don't do it. So, eh. Um, but I'm going to try. It's just not working yet for ASF info specific details. Um, but essentially, what you want to do is you want to make it so that people have contributed code are encouraged to review, but people don't often feel comfortable reviewing code they're not familiar with. Um, while I'm more than willing to do that, most people don't seem to enjoy that experience. But if someone comes and changes code that they've written, they're often more willing to take a look at it, but they don't know that because they don't go and look at your PR review dashboard every day. And so you can use tooling to auto-mention to them that, like, hey, there's this thing. I think you'd be a great fit to look at it. Um, and then like, they can be like, oh, yay, I, I totally am. And they can help you out. Um, the other one is a PR review dashboard. Um, if you if you have like mailing list changes, a similar dashboard would probably be a lot more work to make, but it's also really useful. And the idea is that um, for a lot of projects, we have many separate components inside of it, and a lot of the people who, even as like full-time committers, may only be interested in small subsets of those, right? And this makes it really easy for me to go in and be like, I care about Python today, or I care about machine learning today, and this is the part that I want to review. And then I can also see, is this code in a state where it's going to be ready for me to review it? Like, um, is it passing CI, or is it failing? Who else has taken a look at it? Um, and have they said it's good or bad, right? There might be people who are not yet committers who uh, say, like, this code is good. And then if I'm used to working with them, I might be like, oh, yeah, it's probably really close. I can just go take a look at this. And this will also be really useful for getting this person to become a committer. 
Um, and so I think that this little dashboard is really cool. It's, it's certainly not perfect um, and needs to be customized to each project, but I think building something like this can help. Um, yeah, so, but I really want to say, even as much as these tools can help, um, we fundamentally have a community problem at this point where we're overwhelmed. Um, we can't just buy people more Mate or Red Bull. Um, we, we, need to, we need to scale the number of people involved. Um, and, and I think this is also really important, um, is to decide what we're not doing. Um, and this is the example I mentioned with auto-closing issues. Uh, Spark is, is a lovely project with a lot of imperfections, um, but one of the things which we've done an okay job is constructing roadmaps of our machine learning stuff specifically. And it's like, these are the things we are willing to do. Everything else, probably not. Come and talk to us before you write code here. Um, and, and the other part of this is, if you're not going to do something with your project, try and make it pluggable so people can still get their thing done, and you don't have like three different forks of your project that are all slightly out of sync, like we did with the Kubernetes support for Spark. That one didn't go so well. Um, we, we decided we weren't going to do a thing, but then we also decided that it was going to be way too hard to make it pluggable. And so three different people all just decided, you know what the solution to this is, a fork. And they were all right. It was very unfortunate. Um, Interact does a good job of having like a really clear roadmap of what they're doing, and also making it accessible. It's, it's in their GitHub. It's not hidden somewhere else. Like You, you get this when you're checking out the code. Um, our roadmap is not as discoverable for machine learning inside of Spark, um, and there's some notes about it in here. Um, and you can see some examples. Uh, okay, the, the other one, like we can try and take our like however many committers we have and and just make them more productive with these tools, but it's it's really not enough. Um, you're you're going to have to make it so that your committers are more, feel less, sorry, fuck, damn it. OK, the part that I wanted to say here, um, and I screwed up, is one of the things which I see happen with a lot of new committers is that they get their commit bit, and they're like, this is amazing. Oh my god, what about if I break the project? Everyone is going to hate me. They're going to realize that I'm a complete fraud. They're going to take this away from me. Oh dear god, oh dear god. Um, and just make it OK to break. Master, we have version control. Um, if you don't, go get version control. Um, this is OK. If you want to accidentally break the project yourself to show people that it's OK to break the project, that is OK. It's not exactly lying. Um, and one person is ex two people are excited about that. And, and just lead by example. And when they break the project, don't yell at them. Be like, cool. Let's see how to revert this. And let's talk about why this may, like, broke the project and what we can do better next time. Um, more tests can also always help, et cetera. Yay. Um, fundamentally, you probably need more committers if you're in the PR overload. Um, you can encourage people to become interested in becoming committers by being like, man, being a committer is so cool. I go to these conferences. Yeah. Sometimes people will be like, that sounds exciting. I'd love to do that. Other times they're like, I don't want to go to a conference. No. No. And you can be like, that's totally cool too. Don't you want to just be able to like make the project better faster without having to wait on other people? And they're like, yeah. That does sound like a good thing. I'm tired of waiting on other people. Um, and you know, if these people are becoming committers, there's a good chance that you have gotten to know some of their personality, so tailor your message to them. Um, evaluate how you pick committers. Um, I think this is challenging for us in, in the ASF sometimes. Um, consensus voting is a really great way to eat at the Cheesecake Factory. And while I've only gotten food poisoning at the Cheesecake Factory once, I do not want to eat at the Cheesecake Factory all that often. Um, and so if some people are consistently using their veto perhaps aggressively, it can be a good time to be like, hey, do you like doing a lot of review work? Because I want to share this with other people. What can I do to make you more comfortable with sharing this with other people? Like, 
these people want to help us. Um, making guides for committers so that they can actually see how to become a committer. Um, right? You might have contributors that just don't know how to move beyond that. Um, and mentoring people, that doesn't really scale, but you can like mentor people, and then you can be like, and one of the great things that you get to do as a committer is mentor new committers. And then, then it sort of scales. It's like that bad pyramid marketing where we sell you makeup. Uh, except I sell you open source software for free. Yes, okay. Um, there are lots of ways to mentor people. Um, it's hard to scale. It's hard to find people really excited about mentoring if you do hang on to them. If you can't, just drink a lot of mate and then mentor some people. Um, and then you need to move them on to effective committers. Um, I think one of the things which as much as we love the dev list, sometimes it can be overwhelming and scary for new committers because they are like, oh no, I must pretend that now I know everything. Oh God, I can't ask what to do. So, so make it like, hey, it's okay to come and ask me a question. It's totally okay. Um, and a lot of the mentoring stuff is about your own project as illustrated by this uh, thing that I clipped out of the ASF website, mentoring a new committer. Here's the basics that are true across all Apache projects to do. Um, if anyone wants to fix that, pull requests welcome. Um, but more seriously, I, I think this is very much a good indicator of the fact that as much as I can tell you mentoring is important, it is all about communicating the things specific to your project. Um, making it easier to contribute. You can get new contributors. They can become committers. Life is great. Um, reduce the overhead to contribute well, make it easier for people to make it not so hard for you. Good documentation about how to do this. Um, decisions are going to get harder. Uh, even with consensus voting, you have this feeling of loss of control sometimes. Please, you know, be better about that. And technical things can explode, but that's pretty much on you. I'm not going to be able to help you with that in the remaining three minutes. Um, technical problems can often be fixed with technical solutions, though. So yay! Um, wrapping up, it's OK not to be perfect. This is fine. Everything is fine. Yes, the project is on fire, but the marshmallows are delicious. Most importantly, I have this book. It is unrelated to this talk. But each book covers about a quarter of a cup of coffee in San Francisco. And you can help me from turning back to a life of enterprise support contracts. Um, and you can buy this book. So uh, with that, um, oh yeah, I'll be doing a bunch of shit. Um, yay, we're done. OK. Ooh, if you can pretend to be excited for like 30 more seconds. There we go. Thank you. So, questions? Okay, so the question was if I could show the previous slide. This is the previous slide. I'll be doing some live stream code reviews. Um, I'll do a code review today and some live coding tomorrow. And I'll do office hours at a coffee shop nearby. And if you want an excuse to go to New York, uh, you can come hang out with me next week. Do you have any tips for dealing with entitled users that post on the mailing list and then a day later open an issue and then a day later DM you on Twitter and then a day later have mailed your personal email address and you think might be about to turn up at your house? Those kind of people that, that really care but maybe are getting a bit overwhelming. Yeah, that's a really hard question to answer. Um, Personally, if someone shows up at my house, uh, that is probably the point where I would call my corporate security team and uh, also um, let my neighbors know not to let in people asking about open source software. Um, <laughs> I really hope that the strange people that show up at my house just try to continue to sell me candy bars. Um, for the like Twitter DMs and stuff, uh, I normally am just like, listen, I would love to help you, but it just doesn't scale. You need to go to the list. Um, I'm really sorry. I just don't have the time. And if they don't respond well to that, then I block them because I, I, I just can't deal with that. I don't like getting yelled at, and then it makes me not 
help the other people. So what is your view on canned replies to common questions as opposed to a personalized reply? Do you amazing. have a perspective? Amazing. Canned replies are amazing. Um, if people hate them, then reconsider and write a better Perl script for your canned replies. I love your advice. Thank you. And I will subscribe to your newsletter. Yay. Thank, thank you. I, um, I actually do have a newsletter. It's at highperformancespark.com, um, I think, probably. Yeah, you, you can also follow me on Twitter. Yay! <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, but for the other fine folks in the room who wish this high-quality content of jokes about Pearl. Hey. It's pretty solid. Okay, hold on. Thank you very much. Oh, you. We have a small coffee break in the Palais. Mm. I love coffee.